Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Denise Abdul Rockman, and we're hosting another episode of the Global Afro Beat live stream, right straight out of Egypt, Sharm El Sheikh. And uh, it's so uh, good to have everyone. Uh, this uh, live stream, this uh, Afro Beat started uh, kind of as a collaborative uh, from PACJA, uh, Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance and the Chisholm Legacy Project when we got together and created a global Afro-descendant climate justice collaborative. And we have over 41 organization representative countries and about uh, 200 uh, different attendees. And uh, we've just been working together for the sake of our own um, political and education and the ability for us to transform and liberate our communities and try to uh, debunk all of these systems that uh, are against us. Uh, so just so happy to try to bring folks together and to have uh, such an important discussion. And tonight uh, we have a wonderful person uh, whose name is Yershel uh, Rodriguez. And I'm gonna ask uh, Yershel, thank you so much for making it on the Global Afro Beat. And uh, you, know, you can share like even where you're at right now, where you come from, who you define your community as, and just anything that you wanna share uh, as you uh, morph into this collective at this moment. Thank you for hosting me today for the invite. Um, like you said, my name is Rochelle Rodriguez Hooker. I am from Colombia from the archipelago of San Andres, Old Providence and St. Catlina. And we are the home of the third greatest coral reef barrier and the protectors and the guardians of it. And right now um, I'm also in Sharm El Sheikh um, being part of um, COP27, um, representing my community, but also um, part of the um, If Not Us Then Who organization, that is an indigenous led organization that we focus in um, impact storytelling from the territories, from the indigenous, local, and Afro descendant communities, um, having the opportunity to tell our stories from our point of view and us being the ones that, that like make it. Like, um, so, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I would love to um, go further in conversation. And once more, thank you for having me. Thank you, appreciate it. Oh, and look who we've got stopping in. We've got Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Uh, welcome to the Global Afro Beat. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. We're just kind of uh, getting to know each other right now. And uh, Yoshelle just shared a little bit about herself and uh, wondered if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, who you define maybe as your community uh, and uh, you know, just what uh, you look forward to uh, as it relates to, I guess, movement and change. Yeah, well, hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to hold space with you. I'm Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Um, I've been working on social justice issues since I was 16, and I've been blessed um, to help to play a small role in the environmental justice movement and uh, climate justice movement. And, and my community are all the vulnerable communities um, around the planet. So um, that's why we do the work, to make sure that people can move from surviving to thriving. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, tonight we just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, if you've been at the COP27, you know, what kind of sessions you've went to, what kind of intel that you've heard that you can share with our communities that could be anywhere around the globe right now. And then we're hoping that whoever might be listening to this live stream right now might ask us some questions or tell us some things that they want us to take back to the negotiators or to whatever space that we're at 
that we're trying to influence uh, this body of work around climate, around racial justice, um, and systems change. Uh, so, Yershel, can you go ahead and share, like, even some talks you've been on or, you know, um, different sessions that you've been in and why you think it might be important? Yeah, well, um, principally, I have been like focusing um, on attending spaces um, that are focused on culture, like the Culture Cup, um, being at the Indigenous um, Forum spaces, and um, just like sharing from um, our point of view from my community, what is going on and the um, demands we have. So for me, it has been really important to have these type of spaces in the COP because COP is so, um, I don't have the word, like everyone is just like doing like business and stuff like that. But it was really important like this year to have like um, the indigenous pavilion and the culture cup and the culture hoop, uh, where we really got the chance to share our experiences from, all, from like from our communities, from our way of viewing life and having like that safe space and in cup to can um, connect with other and really have like this transformative um, relationship, connect with people, connect with um, other organizations that are working um, similar um, stuff like we do. So yeah, for me, it has been really, really important. And I um, really applaud this year COP to have um, these spaces for um, the minorities, for the local communities, for the upper descendant communities and the indigenous communities. Oh, thank you so much, Rochelle, for lifting that up, that you're saying that you felt that the culture uh, is the most important area of the COP and all of our relationship building and sharing and things of that nature is where, where you've been hanging out at. Uh, so I want to uh, just welcome uh, Reverend Ambrose Carroll. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for making time uh, to stop by the Global Afro Beat. And uh, if you could just kind of share uh, with our audience who you are and um, what you do, uh, who your community maybe is. Uh, and then later on, we'll kind of ask you if you were here at COP27, you know, what would you want folks to push for or what would you want to have happen? But if we can just start with you introducing, appreciate it. Oh, very much. And again, my apologies. Uh, I am uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm uh, very glad to be on the call. My name is Pastor Ambrose Carroll. I'm the pastor of the Renewal Worship Center in Oakland, California, and the uh, founder and CEO of an organization called Green the Church. Uh, we are working at the intersection of the environmental uh, and sustainability movement and the black church. We're work, really working to wake up what I believe is the issues of climate, environmental justice, uh, and sustainability. And I'm glad to be on the call. Thank you so much. Uh, so we've got some sustainability going. We've got some black faith happening for for some reason that connectivity to our Afro descendantness and we've got where we want to have these relationships with each other. Uh, all for what? Why are we doing all this? Uh, but I'll uh, kick it over to uh, Mustafa Ali, Dr. Mustafa Ali to kind of share what sessions you've been uh, hanging out at and kind of what your take is on this cop, what you've heard and and then maybe you could respond to why we you know are really leaning into our blackness, our relationships. Why is that? Yeah, you know, I've been really blessed that I've been in, in so many um, different sessions, either you know speaking or moderating or listening and learning. And um, you know one of the things that is different about this cop than previous cops, um, has really been an honoring of environmental justice and climate justice in a more significant way than I've, than I've ever seen before. I mean, a big part of that probably also is that now we have the Climate Justice Pavilion, 
um, and the amazing work of both uh, Dr. Robert Bullard, uh, Peggy Shepard, uh, Dr. Wright, um, but then a whole bunch of other folks like Jackie Patterson also and the amazing work that she's done um, and really zeroing in on you know, the language um, that goes inside of resolutions to hold people accountable, to move the process and then to hold people accountable. And, and I share that um, because, you know, one of the interesting sets of conversations at the beginning was really around reparations, right? You know, for those of us who are of African descent and of the diaspora, you know, it's really important that, that folks understand uh, the pain and the trauma that has been caused by fossil fuels, but also that we understand that we have a North Star, that we have a pathway forward. If one, we have the resources that are necessary um, to help to heal our communities and to heal processes, um, which have to happen as well, because it is those sets of policies, um, both in the United States and in other countries around the world, um, where there was real intentionality about you know, the damage that they inflicted on our communities. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's refreshing that at least we're beginning the process. I know we have a long way to go. And, and Denise, just let me, let me share a, a little bit more because, you know, in my conversations also with a number of folks who are in business and industry, they're also um, trying to figure out how to be a more effective partner, um, to be an authentic ally. Um, now, we all know that we have to really take a look at what that looks like, because sometimes folks will place a veneer that looks like someone is an authentic partner, um, that someone wants to do the right thing. Um, um, so, you know, we have to, you know, keep one eye open, as my grandmother would say, um, to make sure that there's real authenticity in the words that people often share with us to make sure that they're lining up with the actions. The other part was, you know, being able to spend time in all these different pavilions, uh, representing, you know, people who come from Africa, um, you know, whether it's uh, brothers and sisters in Brazil, we know that there's a strong tie to Africa there, especially in Bahia uh, and a number of other locations and hearing, um, you know, some of the steps that they are implementing to make sure uh, that uh, the forests there uh, are being protected. We know that in the Congo, um, and in Brazil, those are two of the sets of lungs for the planet. Um, so to hear the innovative work that they're doing and also being ex uh, excited because now there's President Lula instead of President Bolsonaro, uh, who we know did not care about indigenous brothers and sisters, did not care about uh, you know, the uh, Africans who, who also moved off into the jungles in Brazil. So we shouldn't forget that because we do have brothers and sisters who are there who often are um, not highlighted. Um, and then to, to also, you know, spend time with folks from the Congo and Zimbabwe and all these other countries and hearing, um, you know, really innovative things that they're doing around sustainability, around conservation. Um, and then also seeing our fingerprints um, and, and, and our hands creating a number of these different sets of tools and new business opportunities, because, you know, that has to also be a part of our just transition. You know, our just transition has to be about ownership by our people um, if we want to be able to build wealth inside of our communities. Um, so I've just been excited. One, the partnerships, um, both those formal and informal partnerships that are happening and seeing um, these opportunities for us to heal, heal our land, to heal our people, um, but also to make sure that we are also healing the economic disinvestments that have happened inside of our communities. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I was just on a panel with the UN Global Compact for Brazil uh, with a bunch of business leaders that were talking about the water resiliency. And uh, just like, uh, you know, all across the globe, it seemed to be when I spoke with some of my Brazilian uh, brothers and sisters were saying that it is the... Um, black people that are most direly impacted and in need of pure water. Uh, they're the ones most direly impacted by the climate. And, uh, but it sounded like the business industry was using, you know, the words around 
justice and equality. So that was kind of refreshing. Um, and then I know that there's some organizations that have been really doing some things around uh, trying to make those businesses accountable by basically having dialogue with them and making them create equity metrics and making them have a relationship uh, with community. And so all this money that's gushing around and all this money that needs to go toward loss and damage, right, that needs to be this uh, public investment to the um, developing uh, nations that have been most direly impacted by uh, climate. Um, and yeah, and so much uh, going on here. So uh, when we think about too, I guess maybe this might be you, your, your shell, but you can speak in however way you want. But I thought I kind of heard like all the psychological and mental stress that, you know, um, these unjust systems are putting on our communities as well. Um, or, you know, whatever you want to say, since you're in that cultural space, I just wondered if that resonated for you or something else. Yeah, well, um, we had the opportunity to have like these like healing sessions and, and talked around like uh, the psychological impacts of being like from my side, being an activist. Um, I have been in the activism world, like um, not by choice, like many of us as um, indigenous and, and black people, we aren't activists because we want to be activists. We, we were made activists because we are like fighting for our land, fighting for our rights. Um, because uh, if, if we don't do it, who will do it for us, you know? So especially I talk from my community because I am from this island, it's so tiny is not even in the world map. So for me as a Raisel um, Afro-descendant woman, it's very important to have these spaces, but also to talk about the trauma. And not only the trauma of um, the stress um, you go through in this activism, but also the trauma of um, feeling the impacts of climate change. I am from the Caribbean, um, I'm from an island, so that made me um, a frontliner directly in the um, climate crisis. Like in just the past two years, my island have been struck by three hurricanes. The second one being the most destructive, it was category five and it swiped out everything that my island had, like uh, infrastructure and a lot of things. And the community, the, the collective trauma we kept from um, having everything lost and also um, have fear for our life. It, it, I'm still processing it. Um, my community is still processing it. Like we're, we're just like recoping, regrouping, like um, because it affects like this climate change thing, it affects your vision of future, your vision of um, whether if you, you, your community is going to um, thrive like um, Dr. Mustafa said or go extinct because like that is what we're talking about when we live in islands like um, in Caribbean, in the Pacific, our livelihoods is being like jeopardized by this climate crisis. And I, I started my activism um, fighting for the Amazon in Colombia. We made this um, lawsuit um, from 25 um, youth from around um, the entire country. We were like, how can we do as um, future generations to start like protecting what is important for us, starting from somewhere. So for us was starting with the Amazon rainforest because it's one of our lungs of the earth, one of our allies in um, tackling um, climate change. So we started there like um, five years ago, we made this lawsuit, we take our president to the court and um, we had the fortune to win that lawsuit. And now in Colombia, you could um, research is um, the sentence is the um, 40, 4360, 4360, um, 
where they declared over Amazon, well, or part of the Colombian Amazon, um, subject of rights. So our Amazon, um, by this lawsuit we did as youth and as future generation, is protected. And we really want that to happen in the entire Amazon region, but not only the Amazon region. And now we're tackling as um, my community loss and damage, because really we cannot um, keep on depending on our governments. We're from the global South. We have issues with financing. We have issues with um, corruption. So we need um, direct finance. We need mechanisms that help directly the communities that are being affected because we cannot like being living like every year, a hurricane, losing your home, losing everything. And like, like have to wait until the government or the really failed systems try to um, help you uh, rebuild. Right now, we're still in our island. We still don't have an, a hospital because our hospital was destroyed by Hurricane Iota. And like two years, and that's like um, one of the most uh, negligent things that have happened in, in my island. Like, why won't you rebuild the hospital for our community? So there is where you start to understand all these colonialism, all um, all the things that happen to us as Afro descendant communities of um, indigenous communities, because it, it, it feels like structural, like what is going on? Like, okay, these people are um, facing these uh, troubles. And if we don't act in the right way or act um, in uh, the financing and, and finding ways to help these communities, really we're going like extinct. Like I, I use the word extremely because that is what I have been feeling the, for the last few years. Uh, I feel like my island, my community is, is going extinct because we will like, if things don't better, we will have to like leave our island because we, we cannot live there anymore. Like every year living a major hurricane or living major floods and even um, having um, our coral reef is, is right now having a hard time after all these hurricanes. And also we're having like this coral sickness. And we know that the coral reef are part of the um, food supply of the world. And we know that our ocean is, um, um, one of the ecosystems that help us regulate the CO2 that is in the in the environment. So really, our community is trying. We're trying to make our voice heard. So we're like um, attending these spaces, and and like I said before, um, like organizations like if not us then who? Because really, if not us then who? Um, uh, helping us like making our voice being heard in these spaces for me is like an honor to be here at cop like from being from this tiny community in in the caribbean and having a space to talk about what is happening and the issues that uh, my community is facing and i'm also grateful for being in this space with all of you amazing people and like having the time and uh to to listen and also to share Thank you so much. And yeah, healthcare is, is a human right. You should have access to medicine and healthcare. And, you know, what would it look like if you could just be all in black joy, you know, and not having to put that cape on and constantly having to fight and to speak out, you know, what would our lives look like if we didn't have to be fighting on the front lines for justice all the time? And somebody else on this show had said that, you know, it's premeditated, you know, is what they're saying. All of this, it's premeditated. Uh, it's no coincidence whether it's uh, your Black diaspora in Colombia or those uh, folks in the uh, Gulf South uh, of the United States or uh, the, uh, the, the Gulf South of uh, South Africa. You know, uh, it's systemic racism, and uh, it's important that the resolution, I guess, that we have, uh, that we hope to put forth as a global Afro-descendant um, climate justice collaborative that is saying that race, uh, racism, and climate reparations is what's uh, needed at this time 
I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Reverend uh, Pastor Ambrose Carroll uh, to just kind of say, I mean, you're in California, you've got all the wildfires, I guess, going on there, and water uh, is an issue, as I understand it, and utility rates and all of that. And, you know, uh, working in the faith base, uh, everything from resiliency hubs is a thing. And, and then I think there's uh, some of our, as we're in this challenge, there is that opportunity for all these jobs, all this money that's, you know, being uh, thrown around. Um, and how do we make sure our communities get access so that we can be safe? And like Dr. Mustafa says, then one day we might be able to just literally thrive, you know, and be uh, at all at and be in black joy. So, uh, what say you, uh, Pastor? Um, uh, yes, uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, just good hearing from uh, uh, Sister Rodriguez. Uh, blessings on you, Dr. Ali. Um, and, these pieces are so huge and we are definitely at a pivotal time in California. We are working, you know, to ensure that funds that are coming in the States get to the right place. We want to be masters of our own fate. Uh, we are, you know, pulling together congregations that own these faith buildings. I always say we don't own a lot of skyscrapers in the black community, but we own a lot of faith buildings. It is perhaps one of our largest assets as a people. We used to own land, but they drove us off of the land. We own faith buildings and we want to make sure that all of those faith buildings are red retrofitted by us, that they are solarized by us, uh, that they have EV charging stations that we're doing the work on. We want to make sure that those buildings that our ancestors sold sweet potato pies and fried chicken for and had note burning services uh, and, uh, uh, that, that we put those to use. Those are a part of our legacy. They are sacred and they should not be fodder for others to come into our community and once again, capitalize off of us. And so we are fighting to aggregate. We are fighting to move, fighting to position ourselves that we can get congregations technical assistance so that they can do the best they can. In Oakland this week, Pastor Curtis Robinson of the Faith Baptist Church, uh, Three years ago, we helped them install solar. This week, they installed uh, their battery. And they can go off the grid at any minute. They can be a help to their community. They're going to help Black folk in their community, Hispanic folk, and the white folk who are gentrifying. All will be able to be helped by that ministry uh, and by that plant. And that's one thing that we're trying to uh, do. I will say, being in Johannesburg today, um, I was at a, a church, uh, a community that's fighting for their lives, that's fighting for their communities. They, uh, they have been living posted in a tent next to the police station in, um, uh, in Soweto because of the amount of deaths, because of the amount of shootings. Uh, as we move through their built structure uh, is a public health issue. And we have to not only, you know, contend with, with white supremacy uh, in white ran uh, nations. We have to contend with the power of white supremacy, even in black led nations. So we have a lot of work to do. And again, just glad to be on the call in solidarity as we look at these things from a global transatlantic from you all. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Ali. Well, you know, I was just thinking about something the good Reverend shared with us, you know, the, the impacts that are happening, you know, in South Africa, you know, it, it's not by accident. There was real intentionality. We understand the apartheid system, the laws that were put in place and the unpacking that brothers and sisters, when they were given an opportunity uh, to reclaim their leadership have been struggling with, but of course, as folks left South Africa, as white South Africans did, we know that they also took many of the resources with them as they left. Um, so that brought me back to, you know, the moment that we find ourselves in now. Um, you know, I speak about the clean economy all over our country and across the planet. We also have to be very clear, and I've had these conversations with folks here, 
you know, the less than 2% of the businesses in the clean economy are owned by black and brown folks. So that means that we have to be very careful that the fossil fuel paradigm that got us in so much trouble is not brought forward as we move into this 21st century climate economy uh, sets of opportunities there in front of us. We also have to anchor folks so that we make sure that health equity um, is a part of the steps moving forward because sometimes we have these climate conversations um, and they're not the ones that we're having, but others are leading. Folks forget about the impacts that, that are happening around the world, the real public health impacts. You know, we got 2 billion folks across our planet who have dealt with over the last year unhealthy water, leading to a number of diseases. And as our sister, uh, Yashelle, had shared with us, when you don't have clinics and hospitals and, and you now have to deal with these diseases, um, then that further erodes um, our communities. So we can never let folks shy away from, because they will quickly try and get away from environmental justice or health inequity um, and just want to automatically go to the solutions that uh, will benefit their communities um, and not deal with the holistic or the totality of what we are dealing with inside of our communities. Um, you know, when we look at, you know, how we got to this climate crisis, it's because folks allowed our communities to be the dumping grounds. They allowed our communities to be the places that we placed all those fossil fuel facilities that all of us know, but often get left out of that conversation, but yet as our children who are the ones who are dealing with asthma um, and going to emergency rooms and losing their lives prematurely. Um, uh, you know, most folks don't know we got 7 million people across the planet who die every year from air pollution. Um, so we've got to always bring it home to the realities that are going on. We're looking for authentic collaborative partnerships. We're looking for holistic solutions, but that means that you know, um, our most vulnerable communities have to be at the front of the line. At the front of the line as we're developing policy. And that's why we have to also help more of our folks to understand the utility of being in a COP27 and having more of our folks being COP28. But that also means that the doors have to be further opened to make sure that folks have the resources that are necessary to get to COP28. Uh, and not to just get there, but to know that they are going to be fully honored in that process uh, and that nobody wants to invest their time and it not lead to something. So, you know, we'll have to continue to push um, and, and do the pre-work, uh, then the work when we're in the space, and then the work that comes afterwards, if we're truly going to be able to make sure that we are healing our communities. Because if I often share with folks, you know, you can't win on climate if you don't win on environmental justice. Um, and we have to continue to push that message forward and anchor it and all of these decisions, these important decisions that are going to be made. Um, so I'm excited, but it also I'm, I'm very clear that there's a huge amount of work that has to happen. Um, and, and we've got to, you know, have the resources that are necessary to educate our folks um, when, when all of us go back home, whether it is in Colombia or in Brazil or in the United States. Um, or in parts of southern Mexico, where folks often don't know that our people are there, um, and a number of other locations that we could all call out, that people would be surprised that there are Black folks who have been there uh, for sometimes millennia or at least hundreds of years. Thank you. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, too, our Haitian and Caribbean brothers and sisters, too, that have been uh, really connected with this global Afro uh, descendant collaborative. Um, and uh, yeah, I've often wondered like, you know, there's this whole big, all these United Nation folks are coming here, they're negotiating, they're, uh, you know, wordsmithing all these little, you know, articles and doing different things. And I heard that uh, gender justice was taken off the the table and uh, we're trying to lift up uh, racial justice. And my understanding that's like nowhere near uh, any, <laughs> anywhere in um, these agreements. And then, yeah, so how do we as a collective, yeah, really organize around, you know, we just had Nancy Pelosi here, Representative Pelosi, we had, 
you know, different uh, state legislators that came. There's something about this that one can take back also, once this agreement is finalized, take it back to our communities and say, this is what resulted, this is what we got, this is what we didn't get. You know, now either write your Congress people or write the UN or write someone on either making it real in your communities or either making sure that they take the right messages back for the COP28, I think. Um, so I want to say that, and then I want to say, how explicit do you really think uh, the UN negotiation documents um, should be when it comes to race and racism? Do you, do you think it should be front and center? Do you think it should be void like it is right now? Um, what are your thoughts, Rochelle? Oh, I, I really like this topic because um, I am also part of uh, this um, South American movement, but we're doing it global now. That's the Black Indigenous Liberation Movement because we we understood as minorities in, in, in these countries that we have to come together because we have um, very similar issues and raise our voice together as um, black folks and indigenous folks um, to get our bias out there. And we have this thing that we say that there is no climate justice if there is no racial justice, because we know that the, the core of all this climate crisis is colonization because they came to our land, they took our resources, um, like the fossil fuels, and now we're dealing with the consequences of, of all they, they did and all they took and what they're still taking from our communities. So yeah, I believe like um, the UN should like really um, make this a focus point in, in, in their speech and the narrative that um, we need for the future, for really building um, a climate justice um, movement or a pathway. Uh, yeah, so for me, it's very clear. Like I understood that like from the first moment that if there is no racial justice, there is no climate justice because you have to tackle the core of where this climate crisis is coming from. And is a, a, a crisis of um, exploiting um, our lands, exploiting our seas, exploiting our bodies, exploding, like everything that, that <laughs> like our integrity. So yeah, and as a, as a Rysel woman, like I, I just wanna explain a little bit because, um, the Raisal community is a community of folks that were brought in the, this uh, enslavement um, situation. And we came to this little island where they had us like um, making a, a farming sugarcane and stuff like that from the Caribbean. And we stayed there and we developed our own type of community. We develop our own languages, like with the, the little bit we had from our motherland. So um, now we're fighting for, for, for our culture to keep up what we have built and, and really thrive. So yeah, um, I'm really excited about this point and like having a cup in um, Egypt or like how they have like labeled it the, the African cup, I, I think is really important to speak out on colonization and um, start a pathway in decolonization. So yeah, that's like my, my point for, for this question. Thank you for that. And uh, you know, I get sometimes caught up too because you know, I think climate justice is the vision, right? Environmental justice is the vision, but we're really, anchored and and inundated and drowning in the injustice we're actually an environmental injustice which makes us super vulnerable to climate injustice you know and both of them are because of racial injustice that's been uh you know imposed upon uh, our people so uh dr ali any closing, I guess, kind of remarks uh, on this uh, subject with the UN and racial justice being uh, in the negotiations? 
Yeah, you know, it's really interesting when you understand both the United Nations and some of the actions that they've done in the past. So the United Nations have sent out, what is it, the special rapporteurs, these investigators um, who have traveled to the United States and seen the injustices that have happened, where the toxic pollution has been. Um, and they've done it in other parts of the country. And they have called it out and said that it was, you know, that there are these human rights violations that are happening in that space. So if, we, if you say that on one hand, and you say that it needs to be addressed, <clears throat> and then we move into the cop, um, and for you not to bring forward those lessons uh, and, and, and what you've seen and experienced, then it, it's quite perplexing for you not to move forward um, in understanding that addressing uh, the racial injustice has to be a part of the healing. It has to be a part of the, the strategy moving forward. Um, and if you're a student of history, you understand that, you know, off of the backs of black folks and indigenous folks, um, the industrial revolution had the resource to begin to be able to move forward. Um, so whether you wanna look from a historical context or if you wanna look at some of these investigations that they've done, you know, within the last decade, um, you know, my grandmother says, or mi abuela says, that when you know better, do better. Um, so they know better. Um, so that means that it is now time to do better in this moment. Um, so we cannot go to COP28 um, without making sure that uh, the pre-work um, is honoring um, the, the fact that racial justice or racial injustice has to be addressed um, and that you know, the sets of plans from each of these countries, because many of these countries, you know, they, they know the populations that they have, that they have uh, disinvested in um, and that they have built on their backs. Um, so we, I expect all of these climate plans, these, these uh, NDCs um, to, to actually begin to address, um, because if we can have each of the countries to do it, then it forces um, that to be a part of this process as we move forward. Um, but that it will not happen if one, we don't raise our voices in, in a very strategic way, um, that we don't build these bridges uh, between our brothers and sisters in all these different locations on the islands in South America, um, uh, in, in the United States and in Africa and a number of other locations. So that we're moving forward in a unified voice um, focused on our commonalities. Um, and embracing our power. Um, you know, my mama says, and Denise, you know this, that uh, you have power unless you give it away. Um, we need to utilize our power in a way that is transformative. Um, and that helps to, you know, move our communities forward in a, in a positive direction, but at the same time helps to heal this planet. Um, so it is impossible uh, for us to take one step forward without addressing the racial injustices uh, that have happened in the past and it's actually happening in this moment as well but we can eliminate them uh, as we move forward absolutely and uh we have to do it in the words of dr martin luther king with the fierce urgency of now um comes to mind to me when i think about the haitians and the earthquake that they had and they came to america and other places is what i coined a uh, black climate refugees and were basically put back on a, a plane or a ship and sent right back, um, you know, with no resources and no, uh, you know, uh, no real responsibility for the climate calamities that happened to them. You know, we, the United States is one of the, I think, uh, number one or second most um, contributor to the greenhouse uh, gas emissions, or at least the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions um, in other developed uh, countries. And the underdeveloped countries are really taking the blow um, and not even getting the opportunity to have, you know, uh, the just transition framework that, you know, the uh, movement strategy and the Our Power uh, communities created where we you know, we really want to stop all this bad. We want to move in from this extractive to this regenerative economy. And uh, someone said, is it even fair to ask developing nations to jump right into 
you know, the regenerative economy, um, you know, when all these other systems and then they're being judged when they're using some of these extractive tools. Um, meanwhile, you know, communities, as I understand it in Sudan, don't have access to electricity. Um, and, uh, you know, I know I'm just putting out all these uh, challenges, but we really do, I think it's so important to have a your shell and a Reverend uh, uh, Ambrose Carroll and a Dr. Uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali and all of us working di diligently, but having some self care, you know, for our, because you kind of said it, make sure, you know, the, the genocide of our people, you know, doesn't happen. Um, and so we do have to be more strategic I really look forward to, I think, uh, us really building these global conversations, knowing each other, sharing, you know, what, what you have, what we have, what we can give to each other, right, uh, so that we can support each other's uh, transition. And then there are these other opportunities. Someone mentioned, I think, a, a race um, piece for negotiations happening in December where we really needed to start having our language and frame at that table. So really start being strategic and organized together around that. Um, so then I'll turn it to you, Yershel, for any other um, remarks that you might wanna make sure folks hear. Uh, and I did forget that, you know, for anybody in the live stream, if you do want to submit a question before we close out, we'll be more than happy to answer your question, or if there's something you wanna tell us to be taking back in this second week of the COP27, um, we can do that. Whether we're still here or whether we're uh, back home, we can still get that message uh, delivered. Um, your shell? Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to use the word in Spanish that is voy a recogerme las palabras del doctor Mustafa Santiago. I'll, I'll like um, um, take some of his words because it's important like this is what is happening like we um, building these um, knowing each other um, building the bridges like um, and speaking the 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 same like language if, if we could say it like that like like get uh, addressing um what is going on in our communities but unifying our voice so it, it it be more louder because we need to be loud we need to be really loud in what is happening so they really put us in the spot where we we need to be because we need to be the center of all these climate negotiations as um, black community, as Afro-descendant community, as indigenous community, we should be the ones in the center and um, understanding what is going on and also proposing the solution. Because in our communities, we know that we have been um, vulnerable, vulnerabilities, but uh, we also are the ones that have the most pristine ecosystems the ones that have lived with the with the environment and we're the ones that are protecting the 80 percent of the um ecosystems that are still healthy so we are the core key in these topics uh, i i don't think that like um talking and negotiating around carbon stocks or who's going to give more money is 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 the key the key is coming back uh, understanding where we're from, understanding what we fight for and move forward. But we must be in the center. And that's why it's important our voices and having these spaces to talk, to um, expose what we're, what we're doing and collaborate. Exactly. So uh, thank you uh, for being on the global Afro beat. Uh, we do have a question here. Uh, do you all think that we will see justice as part of the language coming out of COP27? I know we brought justice to COP27. Will the nations of COP27 take justice back home? Anyone 
Does anyone well, I think, think we're going to get it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think we, we, we continue to plant the seeds of justice and we continue to water those seeds. And many of the things that our sister Rodriguez just shared with us. Um, but I, I, you know, justice cost, right? Uh, and that means that, that that cost is our time um, and our commitment and, and us staying engaged. Um, so we're gonna have to continue to work <laughs> because no one has ever given our communities anything. Um, we've had to always fight for each and every uh, step of the way. Um, so I, I think that there will be some positive actions but we gotta continue to not make someone else's minimum our maximum. Um, and if we do that and we stay focused on the North Star, um, then I, I think that we will be able to continue to build uh, step by step, piece by piece. Um, and that means we're gonna have to stay engaged in all these different types of negotiations that are part of this process. Sometimes folks just see what's going on here in these two weeks at COP. And you know, there are other. Um, engagements that will be happening between the next COP. Um, you know, there's actions that will be happening in bond. Um, and, you know, we got to have people who are there and who are staying engaged. Uh, there are these other sets of conversations that are part of this global set of actions that are going on. Um, so one, we got to make sure the folks know that they exist. Two, we got to make sure that we are helping folks to be prepared. So when they move into that space, that they feel comfortable and confident. Um, and then we've got to make sure that we are supporting uh, those individuals who um, are, are helping to represent us and make sure that information is coming back, that it's transparent, that everybody is aware of what's going on. Um, it, it's almost like voting. And, you know, it does not stop. You know, we have to continually stay engaged in that process if we want to be able to benefit, you know, from the resources that come out of that, the sets of actions and the power um, that that comes from that. Um, so to answer, you know, the, the, the person who shared that with us, you know, we've got a lot more work to do and we will still we will continue to see, um, you know, positive change happen if we force positive change to happen. Thank you. Definitely. In one day, we're always going to keep hope alive. Right. <laughs> Jesse Jackson. Uh, but and uh, just before we close out here, I just want to say that. We do have what we call the Global Afro Descendant Climate Justice Collaborative. We're gonna, we were meeting every week. We'll be meeting monthly now. Uh, we hope to identify secretariats for different regions or either for maybe different forms of advocacy, you know, food, water, that type of thing. Um, the collective gets to decide. Uh, we have this resolution that we have been socializing that we ask that your organization sign on to called uh, Race, Racism and Climate Reparations to this UNFCC framework. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, sign it. And um, I think that's all that we have for now. Uh, really appreciate Dr. Ali, uh, Yershel Rodriguez, and Pastor Ambrose Carroll for making time in your life and, and joining us and sharing and anyone that's out there on the live stream uh, that's been listening. Uh, this concludes uh, the global Afro beat. And again, we're done dying. Mm -hmm.